All right, here we are again, still talking about Chaucer. And today we are going to begin to talk about the Wife of Bass prologue, and then we'll be talking about her tale. But I want to go back to something that I only very briefly introduced in our last segment. And this has to do, once again, with one of the best illustrations we have for the dramatic principle in the Canterbury Tales, and that is what Kittredge called the marriage group. What Kittredge called the marriage group. And so, Scott, if we can go to the PowerPoint. Yes, thank you. So you'll notice that, first of all, we have a group of tales in which we are going to expect characters not only to tell tales that are expressions of their own personalities and are therefore appropriate to the characters whom we saw described in the general prologue and who now are the tellers of tales, but also a group of tales in which these characters, these pilgrims, are interacting with one another through the telling of tales. This begins with the wife, according to Kittredge's theory, the wife of Bath, who starts a debate over who should have the mastery in marriage, the man or the woman. And she argues, as we shall see in some detail here, that female mastery leads to the greatest happiness for both. In other words, a marriage or by extension, other kind of relationship, between a man and a woman is happiest when the woman is really in charge. And we'll see how that plays out in her prologue and tale. The clerk replies with a case for male mastery. And he tells a story in which no matter what the husband does, the husband always comes out right and the wife constantly has to prove herself and he is the judge of her. And I'm going to go into these uh, tales in a little bit more detail as we go along. But clearly the clerk is responding to the wife of Bath and his telling of his tale is a way of interacting with her. That's the important thing in terms of the dramatic principle, okay? And then, if we can go back to the PowerPoint, please. And then the merchant gives a very cynical view of marriage as the site of exploitation and deception. We have an older husband, quite a bit older, by the way, than his young wife whose young wife has an affair and there's all sorts of trickery and deception going on. And so the merchant's tale really provides us with a very cynical view of marriage. And then finally, according to Kittredge's theory of the marriage group, the Franklin, remember we talked about the Franklin, we didn't look at the description of the Franklin in the general prologue last time, but we did talk a little bit about the Franklin, who is a kind of country squire, what later on would be called a country squire, that is to say a wealthy land owner in the country, not himself a member of the aristocracy, but somebody with sufficient wealth and land holdings that he would be able to move socially in the same kinds of groups as the aristocracy. And certainly that was true as time went on in English history. And the Franklin offers what, according to Kittredge, is a seemingly egalitarian view. Egalitarian view, that is to say, as equal. Egalitarian view of the relations between men and women in marriage. In other words, that neither the man nor the woman should have the mastery, but both the man and the woman should share equally in making decisions in the marriage. So, we will be talking about this and we'll actually be testing Kittredge's theory in part through the text that we're going to be looking at in just a few minutes, but also in part through my telling you about what's going on in the other tales. 
So, the first thing that we find when we turn to the wife of Bass Prologue is, as I said, an instance of the dramatic principle at work. First of all, because her prologue is autobiographical and it is therefore very much an extension of her personality, we learn a great deal more about her in her long prologue to her tale than we had learned already in the general prologue. Also, we pick up on some of the hints and suggestions in the description in the general prologue and expand on these a great deal in the prologue to her tale. And the prologue to her tale is in some ways a kind of ironic misnomer because it's a good deal longer than the tale itself. And this starts off, according to Kittredge's theory, the debate over marriage. And it's not just over whether marriage is a good thing or a bad thing or whatever, you know. I mean, it is simply assumed that marriage is going to be a fact of life for most people. And so the real question then is, what are the conditions under which people can live happily together in marriage? And there is the great debate over power. Who has the power? Who doesn't have the power? Or to what extent can power be shared? So let's turn to the wife of Bass prologue and look at how she begins. Experienza. Experience. So non octorite experience is not exactly the same thing as authority. But she's going to say that's sufficient for her. Now, what she's getting at is that within the scholastic system of medieval philosophy and theology and academic discussion and debate or disputation, let me write this on, on the uh, tablet. Scholasticism, which also gives us scholastic philosophy and scholastic theology and uh, the scholastic approach to the acquisition of knowledge and the testing of knowledge. How do we know that what we know is true and so forth? And within the system, the intellectual system of scholasticism as it developed in the 12th and 13th and 14th centuries, in the universities by some of the great thinkers of this period, people like uh, Abelard and uh, Albertus Magnus or Albert the Great, Thomas Aquinas, also known as St. Thomas Aquinas, Duns Scotus, William of Ockham, uh, you know, Bonaventura and so forth. These were all very great thinkers of the central and later Middle Ages. And they are all associated in one way or another with a very large intellectual movement known as scholasticism. And one of the things that happened in the analysis of a subject and in establishing one's proof, I mean, after all, if I set forth propositions or claims about the truth or falsity of something, presumably there are going to be certain rules of logic and of evidence. What's going to count in proving my case. Well, clearly one form of proof was the citing of authority. Now, if it's a religious discussion, the citing of the Bible as an authority would clearly be important in terms of establishing or even proving one's point. Also, some of the most authoritative commentators on the Bible could also be cited in favor of one's claims. Outside of the area of religion, uh, in the area, say, of science, 
let's say, medicine, one would be able to cite the great authorities of past and present in support of certain kinds of claims about the diagnoses and treatments of certain diseases. The same thing could be true of astronomy, so that uh, the establishment of authorities would be extremely important. Aristotle, for example, based on uh, his observations and the observations of other ancient Greeks, had come to certain conclusions about the planets and about the movements of the planets and the stars. And of course, they did not, in the ancient world, have the advantages of having telescopes. And so much later on, the end of the 16th century and the beginning of the 17th century, when Galileo is looking through his telescope and seeing things that contradicted what Aristotle said, that's what caused that huge debate over Galileo's findings and his publications. Because what he was doing was challenging the authority of Aristotle. Well, in one sense, we could say, well, who cares? You know, after all, you know, it wasn't that Aristotle was, was stupid or ill-educated or hadn't really thought seriously enough about these problems. He just didn't have the same technology that, that Galileo did and therefore could not possibly have made the same kinds of observations. Well, it was more complex than that because by now, as I mentioned last period when we were talking about the clerk and the rise of Aristotelian philosophy and the rediscovery of Aristotelian philosophy by the, by the Arabic philosophers in the Middle Ages and the transmission from those Arabic scholars of the ancient texts into Western Europe where they came to be translated into Latin. What happened in that whole intellectual revolution was a rethinking of Christian theology in terms of Aristotelian philosophy. Now, in the very early days of Christianity, you may think, by the way, that I'm getting away from the wife of Bath, but I never really digress. This is, this is coming right back to the point, as you shall see, you shall see in a moment. The, um, the, uh, the point here is that in the very early days of Christianity, the earliest Christians were not intellectuals, but fairly quickly there were intellectuals, at least some intellectuals who were attracted to Christianity. Paul, for example, was an intellectual, very well-educated guy. Uh, the author of the Gospel according to John was clearly an intellectual and obviously very well-educated. Uh, the person who wrote the uh, Gospel according to Luke and Acts of the Apostles, the same person, by the way, they were originally just one text. Uh, that person was clearly well-educated and a highly intelligent person. So there were, of course, in the earliest Christian communities, there were educated and intellectual people. But not everybody is an intellectual, and not everybody thinks about religious questions in the same way that intellectuals do. But as the church expanded and as it began to attract more people who were well-educated and who wanted to ask serious philosophical questions about Christian belief, where do you suppose they turned? They turned to the already existing philosophical systems that were prevailing in their time. And in the eastern end of the Mediterranean, in particular, where Christianity was beginning, the most prestigious philosophical system was a form of Platonism with a kind of admixture of Stoicism. Now, I'll talk about that more in another class. But what I'm getting at here is that in the early Christian church, there was a thinking through of many of the most important theological issues in terms of Platonic philosophy in particular, and to some extent in terms of Stoic philosophy. Now, in the, St. Augustine, by the way, the great St. Augustine, the African St. Augustine, is, is a very good example of what I'm talking about. One of the 
the premier intellectual leaders in the whole history of Christianity. Um, you know, after Jesus and Paul, Augustine has to be number three in terms of the most important intellectual figure in the history of Christianity. So, the, uh, and he was essentially a Platonist, by the way. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on as it comes up. But in the 12th and 13th centuries, with the reintroduction of Aristotle and Aristotelian thought into the West, there was, once again, a rethinking of many fundamental Christian teachings in terms of Aristotelian philosophy and philosophical categories. And part of what happened then was that the prestige of Aristotle went way, 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 way up. That's why the clerk would rather have 20 books of Aristotle's philosophy clad in black and red at his bedstead than to have all kinds of finery. And that's why, as I mentioned in a previous class, Dante, arguably one of the very greatest writers, if not the greatest writer, of the whole Middle Ages, and, and certainly in world literature generally, called Aristotle the master of those who know. The master of those who know. Well, uh, to challenge then the authority of Aristotle was to take on the heaviest hitter around, as it were. So when Galileo challenged the authority of Aristotle, which he was doing in effect by coming up with different observations and therefore conclusions, it, as a result of his experiment, then that was obviously going to get him into trouble. Because for one thing, the, the Roman Catholic Church, and remember that, that Galileo was an Italian, uh, and he was living within a Catholic community, the Roman Catholic Church had so closely tied much of its teaching to Aristotle and Aristotelian thought that it was thought by many that a challenge to Aristotle would undermine the authority of the church itself. So what I'm getting at in this somewhat long-winded uh, exposition here is that authority became extremely important in terms of the whole scholastic approach to knowledge and how one established the truth claims of one's propositions. So that if I say such and such is true, you obviously are going to ask me, how do you know? And on what basis can you establish the truth of that claim? And we have certain kinds of logical procedures for testing those claims, don't we? For example, in science, it's very clear. We'll talk more about this later on when we get to the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, it's very clear that the so-called scientific method consists of a series of procedures by which we test whether or not the case has been proved for a particular claim. The same kind of thing is true in law courts. The same kind of thing is true in, uh, in historical studies to a very large extent. So uh, notice here, the wife of Bath begins by saying, experience, though I know it's not an authority, I'm not citing an authority here, but experience, though no authority were in this world, is right enough for me to speak of the woe that is in marriage. Okay, let me tell you about the woe that is in marriage. That doesn't mean that all of her marriages have been unhappy, but she's going to tell about her experiences, some of which are happy, some of which are unhappy, but all of which, from her point of view, have involved a power struggle a power struggle to see who is going to have the mastery in the marriage. 
four Lord Inga's Sith E, twelfth year was of Aja. Thanked be God that is etern on Leva, whose bondes a church ador e have had fever. Okay, since she was 12 years old, well, people used to get married a lot younger than, uh, than we tend to get married. And while 12 would be young even by medieval standards, it wasn't unheard of. Uh, as a matter of fact, early marriages became a problem to the extent that at some points, in some places, the church would step in and say, well, wait a minute, you know, you can't marry a girl who is younger than 14 or a boy who is younger or a young man who's younger than 16. Uh, but there are lots and lots of exceptions to that. And the very fact that the rules were set that way implies that there was a reason for making the rules. That is, that there were people who were married younger. There, we have cases on record of uh, princes, say, who were going to have an arranged marriage for political reasons, who were betrothed and then married when they were six and seven and eight years old. Well, obviously, you know, from our point of view, what kind of a marriage could there be, you know, in, in that kind of a context? But you can see that, that clearly uh, people did marry earlier. And here she says from the time that she was 12 years old, She's had five husbands. If he so oft a meet on wedded bay, and all were worthy men in her degree. But May was told certain not long agone is that sith that Christ no went never but on us to wedding in the Cana of Galilee, that be the same, the sum and sampler talked he may, that e na shoulder wedded be but honours. There was an argument that came up for a while. Not that many people took it seriously, by the way, but there was an argument that, that was entertained for a while in the medieval church that you shouldn't be married more than once. And that doesn't mean you know, like divorce and remarry. It means that even if your spouse were to die, that you should not marry somebody else. Well, that never became the official teaching of the church, by the way. But there were some who argued that position. And notice, the persons who are arguing that position, according to her, are relying on what? The authority of the Bible, right? Going back to the question of authority. And of course, in questions of religion or religious belief, what would seem to be more decisive than the authority of the Bible? The only problem, of course, being that, as the wife is going to be pointing out, there are various ways of interpreting the Bible. OK. Herk a clo which a sharp word for the nonas beseed a well Jesus, God and man, spak and repray for the Samaritan, thou hasty had fiv whose bond is quod he, that ill command that now hath they is not thine husband. Thus said he certain, what that he meant there be, he can not sane. Okay? See, it's not simply a matter of quoting the Bible, though. What does the Bible mean? You know, what does a particular statement or sentence or passage mean? These are questions of interpretation. But that e ox, we the fifth man, was known whose bond to the Samaritan? How many meeked Shehan in mariage, yet heard he never tellen in mean age upon this number definition. Men may devin and glossen up and down, but well he won't express withouten Leah, God bad us for to wax and multiply. What's she doing? She's citing her own biblical authority, isn't she? You know, in the beginning of the Bible, in the creation story, God creates 
man and woman together and he says, now wax and multiply? Well, what's going on here? That gentle text can he well understand. A quelly wot, he said, that mean whose bond shall let father and mother and talk to me. But if no number mention mada he of bigamia or of octogamia. There were some who said that uh, to marry more than once was really a form of bigamy. That never, by the way, became the official position of the church, but there were some who argued that. And she's saying, this is ridiculous. There's, there's really no scriptural authority to support that. Whether it be marrying two people or octogamy, which would be marrying eight people. Uh, we shouldermen than spake of it villainia. And so then she goes on to cite some biblical cases of her own. Why biblical cases? Because the argument against her having five husbands was being made by people on the authority of the Bible, or at least what they claimed was the authority of the Bible. So what she's doing is she is providing her counter-arguments. Likewise based, you don't notice she does not try to criticize the Bible or to question the authority of the Bible. She takes for granted the authority of the Bible, but then she goes ahead and cites other sources on her side of the argument. Okay, so notice once again the role of authority in arguing and how important that is in this way of conducting arguments. <clears throat> so she's going to, uh, to speak of Solomon. What about him? Etro, hey, how to weave his money own, and so forth. And so she goes on. And she says then in uh, uh, line 50, of fever whose bond is scullying am e. Welcome the sixth one that ever he shall. Okay? Uh, this is what I meant. You know, you may have wondered, well, where, where did this guy get this stuff? Um, you know, when I said, here she is out on the pilgrimage. She's looking for husband number six. Well, you have a right to ask me, where do I find that? So I point to the text and I said, here, this is where I find this. That's exactly the kind of thing that I'm going to ask you to be doing in your papers. When you make certain claims about the author and her works that you will have to be making, what am I going to ask of you? What are you going to ask of yourselves? Where do I find that? What's, what's the evidence? Now, if you're talking about, uh, say, the person's life and times, you're probably going to be citing some authority, aren't you? In the same sense that we've been using the term authority here. Because you will not have been able to go, to go out and examine original sources say, for the life and times of a woman in the 18th century. So you're going to have to rely on the authority of some scholar or scholars, right? And then, however, when you are making certain claims about her work, you're going to be looking at the text. And you will be citing certain things from the text. And that really is what I'm doing here. I don't always say, aha, here's the question, and now let me show you the proof text for what I'm saying. But that, in effect, is how I'm proceeding. Okay? And so she goes on with this, by the way, and uh, talked about, talks about this at, at some length and cites her various authorities and so forth. And... Um, so then she gets into the 
whole question of holy virginity. And what about holy virginity? Well, there were some, and this becomes a tricky business in talking about the history of Christianity. There were some who were ascetics. Let me put that term on the tablet. Okay. Anybody know what asceticism means? Anybody here know what asceticism means? Or what it means to call somebody an ascetic? Yeah? Have a, sure. Um, doesn't it mean like somebody who renounces like worldly pleasures and worldly things? Yes. 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 And generally withdraws. You're absolutely correct. And generally withdraws from the world. Uh, the earliest ones in the second and third centuries went out into the Egyptian desert. And they literally lived in caves, like the famous Anthony of Egypt. Literally lived in caves on almost nothing. You know, just little food and, and some water. Uh, in many cases for years and years and years and years. Talk about renouncing the things of the world. Well, this became actually a very popular idea in late antiquity and in the early Middle Ages. That doesn't mean, by the way, that everybody did this. But that there were some famous people, like a certain Saint Jerome, who is best known for being the guy who translated the, uh, the Bible out of Greek and Hebrew into Latin, and therefore provided Western Europe with the Bible that became the standard for about 1,000 to 1,100 years. And then even after the Protestant Reformation, that continued to be the standard Bible for the Roman Catholic Church up until, really, our own lifetime. So uh, Jerome was one of the great proponents of asceticism, and he himself actually tried it out for a number of years, living in the Egyptian desert. So, asceticism then is a very extreme form of denial of the world, the pleasures of the world, worldliness, the things of the world, and a withdrawal from the world to the extent to which that's physically possible in order to cultivate what was believed to be a higher spiritual consciousness. Now, some of the writings of these ascetics survive, even down to our own time. And in many cases, they are by very, very famous people and therefore have achieved a lot of prominence in our historical studies. The works of Jerome being a classic example of what I'm talking about. Historians often in the past would look at these writings of ascetics and say, oh my God, that's what Christians used to believe, or that's what the church used to teach. Uh, 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 uh. These people were always in a relatively small minority. Remember now that if everybody wanted to withdraw from the world, and if everybody wanted to live a celibate life, and if everybody renounced the possibility of getting married and having children, then none of us would be here, right? Uh, clearly, the vast majority of people were not ascetics and did not embrace the ascetic life. Nevertheless, this was a, an influential current within late antiquity and then in the early Middle Ages, and it continued for a long, long time. And there are still ascetic movements in our own time. So in part, that's what she now is responding to. And uh, she says that there are people who say, you know, holy virginity is the highest form of life. And she says, well, who knows, maybe that's true. But 
if that's true, then where did the Holy Virgins come from in the first place? Obviously, their parents can't have been virgins. So, uh, so she goes on with this argument, which ultimately is essentially an argument in favor of the essential goodness of human sexuality. The essential goodness of human sexuality. Some who were of the more ascetic bent look down on human sexuality to the point of even regarding sexuality as tainted with sinfulness. So that you can even, even find in people like Thomas Aquinas, one of the greatest thinkers of the Middle Ages, and, and certainly a very, very enlightened person. You can even find in Thomas Aquinas, and you can find this in many other writers as well, uh, the notion that, uh, that, that sexuality is associated with the body, which is a sign of our having fallen through original sin to such an extent that it is human sexuality is always tainted with a kind of aura of sinfulness. And the only justification for sexual behavior is procreation of children. And you will have even somebody like St. Augustine, great a thinker and original a thinker and enlightened a thinker as he was, saying that uh, it is improper and perhaps even sinful for people, we're talking about married people now, to, to have sex together if it is not for the procreation of children. Well, then there were some who even argued that even when married people have sex together in order to have children, that still it's a venial sin, maybe not a really serious sin, but what was called a venial sin, a not serious one, but nonetheless a little sin because of the very corruption in the act of having sex. Well, you know, how many people actually bought into that? It's hard to tell. It's hard to tell. But nevertheless, at least officially, one heard a lot of that kind of talk. Now, to what extent did people take it seriously? Hard to tell. Remember I mentioned the penitential manuals? That after the idea of confessing one's sins to a priest was developed in the early church, that uh, there were penitential manuals so that the priest would have to know what the sins were and then would have to know what the, uh, the penances were to assign for different sins according to their severity. You look at those penitential manuals and they are amazing. As they develop, the, uh, the earliest ones have very, very little about sexual behavior and certainly very little about any kind of sexual sins. But as time goes on, that becomes a greater and greater and greater and greater and greater part of the penitential manuals. And you have this elaborate description of all forms of sexual behavior, you know, the most outlandish kinds of ideas, uh, you know, being presented. Well, well, you know, it's hard to tell what these things actually mean. You know, are these in any way reflections of actual social behavior? Or are they simply reflections of the fantasies of the people who wrote them? Hard to tell. Anyway, the point that I'm getting at here is really the point that the wife of Bath is getting at here. She is arguing for the essential goodness of human sexuality. Based on what? Based on biblical authority. Just as her opponents used the Bible, she also is going to use the Bible. And she says, for example, um, in 111 and following, virginite is great perfection, and continence ek with devotion. But Christ that of perfection is wella, bad not that every week he should go sell all that he had and give it to the poor, and so forth. 
Um, and she goes on to say, uh, and word ingas be your lave, that am not e, e will bestow the flutter of mean aja in the acts and in the fruit of mariaja. And then she goes on to make a very, very interesting point. One of the things that had been developed in the uh, scholastic philosophy of the time, based in large part, though not exclusively, on Aristotle, was natural law, was natural law, the whole philosophy of natural law. OK, anybody know what that is? Just sort of a brief description. Well, basically, and I'm simplifying to some extent, I'm going to concede that just for the moment, because we could go on for an entire course talking about natural law and natural law ethics. But the, the basic premise of this is that if something has been created such that its very nature is to be a certain way, and if it was created by God, then it must be essentially good and its behavior according to the nature which God gave it must be essentially good. That doesn't mean that one can't go against nature. But that's the other side of it, that people would argue that there are certain ways of behaving that are really unnatural. Have you ever heard that expression? That something is unnatural? That really is based upon the whole conception that we do right when we follow our true nature, and we go wrong when we uh, depart from what is our true nature. OK, so notice what she's doing here. She says, tell me also, 121, to what conclusion were members mod of, generosi of generation and of so perfect ways erect erect? Wait a minute now. Why, God made us, right? And if God made us, I mean, she's speaking to fellow believers. She's not speaking to religious skeptics here. She's speaking to fellow believers. And she says, OK, God, God made us, right? We all agree on that. Then why did God make us as sexual beings? Could God have been wrong? Are you really saying that God could have made a mistake in making us as sexual beings? What was the reason? What was the purpose for creating members of generation, sexual parts. Trusteth reeked well, they would are not mod for nocht, gloss ho so well, and say both up and down that I were mocked for purgation of urine, under both a thing as smaller was ek tokeno a female from a mala, and for none other causa. Say you know? Okay, she's going to reduce her opponent's argument to absurdity, what in logic and argumentation is called a reductio ad absurdum. The experience, notice she's going back to experience here, not just authority, wot it is not so, so that the clerics, the learned scholars, be not with me wroth, he say this, that they been mod for both. That is to say, for office and for Asa of engendrura, their way not God displays her. We shoulder men ellis in her book as setter, that man shall yield to his weave her debtor, and there and where were shalled he mock his payment if he ne used his sailing instrument. Well, OK. What does that mean? And of course, what she's doing is quoting the Bible here, and so forth. And she says, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, and she says this in 159 and following, one that him list come forth and pay his debt, 
on husband wall he have, he will not let, which shall be both me debtor and me thrall. She's playing, of course, with the biblical quotation. And have his tribulus, tribulation withal upon his flesh wheel that he am his weave. He have the power during all me leaf upon his proper body and not hay. Reeked thus the pastla. Whenever you see in medieval literature somebody referred to as the apostle, it's always Paul. It's always Paul. If it's a different apostle, the other apostle's name will be given. But somebody referred to simply as the apostle is always Paul. Told it unto me, on bad order, whose bond is for to love us well, all this sentence may leaketh every day. Okay, and so then she goes on to recount the story of her first three husbands who were older than she, and in each case, she in effect seduced her husbands and, and used sex to turn them into uh, her servants. She wasn't going to be their servant. She turned them into her servants. And uh, each one of them, given that they were older, eventually died. And so they left her with their property each time. And so she's become a pretty wealthy woman. I mean, she's not super, super rich, but she's, she's really quite well off. And she is the owner of her own businesses and uh, seems to be doing very, very well. Then with husband number four, she, uh, uh, whom she marries when she's about 40, uh, he's a younger man and he is unfaithful to her. And so now we have the turnabout and so she once again, of course, is going to try to get mastery over her husband. And so what does she do? She starts going out on long walks with another young man with whom she does not have an affair, she claims, but she pretends that she's doing this in order to get back at husband number four. And then when hum husband number four dies, she marries that young man whom she's been walking out with who becomes husband number five. And then we have the whole power struggle, which is so famous in her prologue, in how she gets the mastery over him, despite the fact that he seems to have the upper hand, at least for a while. And we will pursue this a little bit further in our next segment.